Hello everyone, my name is Anastasia and I'm working for Postgres Pro. Uh, it's a Russian Postgres scale company. We provide vendor support, but primarily, primarily for local market. Also, we maintain a fork called Postgres Pro to provide all access to various useful features for our customers. It has shorter release cycle than Postgres project and uh, it has some features that cannot be for, for various reasons accepted to Corp. Um, for example, because they do not support some platforms, they do not support, you know, only, they do support only uh, major ones. And also we actively contribute to Postgres Core. Uh, for about three years, I explore Postgres scale code, mostly interested in data storage, efficiency, and indexes, and all that stuff. And so today I'm going to talk about in-core compression for Postgres. You can see the link to slides at SlideShare at the bottom of the slide, so you can download it. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that everyone understands the importance of database compression. We want to store and process more and more data every day. It's, you know, a big data world. And in this talk, I'll try to explain in a nutshell how Postgres actually stores your data. Then I will list a number of things you can, you can check to ensure that your data is packed optimally. And finally, I'll introduce you a new mechanism of page level compression, which will be available in, in, the, uh, in the next release of Postgres Pro Enterprise Edition. So what I want to cover in this talk, um, MVCC copies. You can find a lot of great talks and articles and uh, documentation is quite good about auto vacuum tuning. And uh, here is just a couple of keywords to learn about if you, if you met MVCC bloat. So try PG repack, PG squeeze extensions, <clears throat> read about index maintenance overhead and all that stuff. Uh, another point is wall log. It can also take a lot of space, but it's a kind of derivative of your data. Less data you have, less will be your wall log. Uh, only if not you're one of those risky guys who don't care about crash safety and use unlocked tables. For some use cases, they are really nice. Uh, and uh, since 9.5 release, there is an option to enable wall compression. Also try it, it really shows quite good, quite good performance. So uh, Postgres has raw oriented storage. Uh, physical representation of the row is called tuple. Uh, tuple consists of header and uh, attributes. Tuples are placed at pages, which in turn form the file. That is the format for for all tables, indexes, and materialized views. And um, it's clear that meta information takes some space, but how much exactly? Uh, maybe it's not that, maybe it's not that much. Um, let's, let's estimate it. Imagine we have no data. Uh, fortunately, Postgres allows you to create table without any attributes at all. Um, okay, we can do it. Let's insert 10 millions of, of nothing. Uh, into this table and check the size. Do you have any, any ideas how big it will be? Mm, it's, it's not empty at all. It's not even close to be empty. Uh, it takes uh, 268 megabytes of this space. Um, of course, it's just a synthetic example and has nothing to do with real life, but it's good to keep that in mind and uh, to understand that 100% uh, normalization of, of your schema can lead to increasing database says, size. Uh, probably you don't want a lot of tables with just one boolean value and one integer column. Uh, so what exactly takes uh, all that space? Uh, using page inspection extension, we can look at hidden meta fields and uh, there is info to support transactions a couple of uh, masks with, uh, with bits uh, to, to support 
faster search and faster data access. Uh, there's also data length and other available information that takes 24 bytes per row. And for many use cases, it seems to be really excessive. Uh, good scenario is some read-only data, archive data, uh, where we don't actually need uh, transactional information. Uh, I, I'd love to ask, uh, uh, how many of you has such use cases? Is anyone has read-only tables in your, in your database? Mm, well, okay, a couple of persons. Probably we can, we can make Postgres better for you. <laughs> uh, okay, we're done with header. We know that there is some, uh, some meta information there. Uh, let's look at the data itself. Uh, there is a rule that attributes must be aligned inside the row. It means that when an attribute is followed by another attribute with a large alignment requirement, uh, padding, zero padding will be inserted. Important consequence of this fact is that order matters. Uh, at the picture, you can see that if you have just one table with integer, then big int, and then another integer, you can just um, change order of columns and save, just, just take alignment into consideration and save a lot of space. Uh, of course, it depends on initial database schema, but on one of real databases we got uh, about 20 percent size decrease just for just for nothing actually just reorder, reordering columns uh, one more story about alignment is about b3 in order to access headers we must keep all index entries aligned to eight bytes inside the page and this rule has one pretty non-intuitive conclusion if you have an index of on one integer column, an index on two integer columns, and index on big integer, they all have the same size. So actually that's, that's really, that was really surprising even to me. Uh, we cannot make index smaller, but we can fit more data into it. Uh, that's a place where another feature of Postgres Pro may come in handy covering indexes, which allow you to add non-key columns to primary key index or to unique index. And j that is just, just another instrument to build better schema. Hopefully it will be available in Postgres 10 also in the following release. It also has its pros and cons on heavy, on heavy update, on heavy write load. It won't be so, so good. But if you have mostly read, read only load, it will be quite, it can be quite useful. So one more advice that sounds obvious probably, uh, use proper data types. Postgres has a lot of advanced data types, so use them. Uh, just another real life case, we audited database uh, of one of our customers after migration from SQL Server and uh, PostgreSQL database was um, much bigger than, than expected. And after some investigation, we found out that most, uh, one of the most frequent columns in this, in this database uh, kept uh, user identifier, um, and it was stored as beta instead of using UID type. So after data type change, dramatic size difference just disappear. Oh, that, that shouldn't be that way. <laughs> I need help. Okay. So okay, that was exactly the first type, the first part of my presentation. 
uh, <laughs> a kind of conclusion about uh, use proper data types, rare the columns to avoid padding, do not normalize everything, uh, and yeah. Uh, so we need alignment just uh, just to fast just to make access to those headers faster. Uh, if we we can not align them, but then we have to we'll have to copy them each time we need to access right. we need to access the structure. It's just you know okay, see low level things. <laughs> uh, so. Um, Maybe any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, so um, I can I can say a little bit about mine patches, which is covering indexes, they are already in Postgres Pro because our customers need it. And uh, it submitted to Postgres, to Postgres 10. I, I hope it will be applied to. No. Okay, thank you. So, and next release of Postgres Pro Enterprise Edition will be about Christmas, about this Christmas. So, you know, there's a lot of tricks um, and uh, uh, really major DBAs definitely know all them. You can improve your schema in many ways. You can use toast and uh, everything, but, but it's, it's too difficult. We really want it simpler. So the solution we suggest is uh, CFS for Postgres. Uh, CFS abbreviation came from compressed file system. It's a bit confusing name actually, so we'll probably rename it, rename it in the upcoming release. Mm, so I think it's a good time to ask if anyone uses Postgres on compressed file system here. No? Have anyone tried? Okay, uh, so for some reason, it was really hard to contribute this feature to into Postgres core. Uh, there was a number of proposals in, in last years, and the reason to reject them was, why, not you, why don't you run Postgres on compressed file system? So I think it's, it's a kind of strange, strange answer. Uh, okay, we implemented it inside Postgres, out of box. Uh, the main idea of CFS is to apply compression to the page when, when it is evicted from buffer cache to disk. Not, not to disk, actually, to page cache of your, your system. Uh, since after compression pages have variable size, we need additional mapping, which is implemented in CFM fork of the relation. Just one more file with map. Uh, CFS always writes pages at the end of the file, so it allows to keep writes more sequential, which is quite, quite good, uh, and also makes it possible to implement file extension in a lockless manner using Atomics. In order to remove outdated pages, which are eventually there, uh, CFS has its own garbage collector. There is a set of background workers which read relations segment by segment, copy and leave pages to the new segment and then with minimal locking, switch files and remove old segment. So sometimes, uh, sometimes your files will be locked, of course. Uh, CFS has uh, a number of configure parameters related to garbage collection. You can see them at the slide. In general, this stuff is pretty similar to auto vacuum. You can just uh, set number of background workers, you can set threshold and uh, delay periods. Uh, it's just up to your, to your load. Uh, and it was also possible and really easy to add data encryption 
at the same stage as compression. So the last setting is about switching it on and off. For now, encryption can only be combined with compression. It's essential to perform encryption after compression because encryption itself uh, increases data entropy and makes compression inefficient. Uh, if uh, encryption option is enabled, Postgres will use value of PG cipher key environmental variable. Uh, but for now, this functionality is quite raw uh, and we need re really need more help from experts in encryptions in encryption and data security. If you find it valuable and see ways to improve it, please don't hesitate to, to write us and just share your thoughts. So um, let's look at usage of compression. Uh, for now, compression can be applied at table space level only. So if you want to use CFS, just create table space with compression enabled and so it works. Uh, you just operate the table like before, you can, you can do anything actually, except uh, for one more level of garbage collection, which should be tuned uh, as shown in the previous slide. It's also possible to initiate GC manually. Mm, if there are no background workers, you can just uh, set, uh, you can just call uh, CFS RGC and it's just like calling vacuum instead of after vacuum. So, disclaimer, never trust synthetic benchmarks. Never, ever. We tested compression algorithms on a data set generated by PGBench and size reduction is extremely, unbelievably cool. Uh, the reason is that PGBench tables has a lot of long zeroed strings, so it's it's very good example for compression. Uh, but still, we can see that um, data load became two times slower because it is really you know CPU bound probably. Uh, there is not not that much data; it fits into memory, so uh, most most of bottleneck is, uh, is at compression stage, but it's still not, not dramatic. Two times is quite, quite, quite good. Uh, database size became 18 times smaller. Never trust synthetic benchmarks. Uh, and uh, real, real benchmarking showed that TPS became 5% better, which is, which is about the same result. It, it doesn't get worse, it, it's not that better, but about the same. So we also compared various compression algorithms at, this, at the same time in the data set, but it's, uh, it's the same for all algorithms, so it's okay to compare them. You can see results at the slide, and by the way, you can notice that Postgres internal compression algorithm, which is in the middle, is a bit outdated for now, so so it can be improved, we should think about it. Um, and while it's easy to make compression algorithms pluggable and give user choice, uh, for the first release we choose to leave only ZSTD algorithm uh, as default compression algorithm um, as, as providing best compression ratio and uh, acceptable speed. So that's quite, quite interesting results. Uh, speaking about real data, we have tried a number of data sets, uh, real, data, um, real databases, and as you can see, results are still pretty good. That is because of both real data nature, which is, which is never absolutely random, and therefore it can be compressed somehow, and because of positive metadata redundancy, yeah. Uh, just, just whatever was in the database, it was compressed. But like, did you have indexes in the database? Yeah, there was some. So it's it just, uh, you know, real database, we just moved it to another compressed table space with all indexes, with all, you know, materialized views, with everything. Um, so I tried to explain uh, metadata redundancy at the first part of this presentation, so even, even empty, 
e even random data can be compressed quite, quite well. So some more benchmarks on real data. You can see that after applying compression, our usage significantly decreased. It, it is exactly what we expected. Um, and there is no dramatic CPU overhead for compressions. For compression numbers are about the same as before. Uh, that is because each page is decompressed only once when it loaded to a buffer cache. And one more point to mention is that now Postgres uses, <coughs> uses double buffering, which means that pages are evicted from shared memory, not directly to disk, but to OS cache. Uh, and in most cases, that is a disadvantage, but for CFS, it happened to be a good, good thing. Uh, because in some cases, compressed data can fit into OS cache and thus avoid a lot of costly disk operation. operations and it shows much better results than these benchmarks. Um, so just like, any, just like any other approach, CFS has its advantages and disadvantages, so pros are, are quite clear. It has good compression rate, because all information in the page can be compressed. It, has, it provides better locality because uh, pages are written sequentially. It, uh, it's good to point that it brings minimal changes to Postgres curve so we can, we can fix it easily and we do not depend on Postgres changes a lot. And uh, there is also flexibility to add various compression algorithms, encryption functions, and all this stuff. Um, some limitations of CFS is that buffer cache keeps pages uncompressed. uncompressed. That's, that's not actually a problem because CFS doesn't add CPU overhead for cache data to, to access each row. It's just one decompression uh, one call to decompress the page, <clears throat> and pages are still compressed in OS cache. Next issue is wall and replication. Replica has to perform compression and garbage collection, collection itself. It it's probably can be improved, but for now, compression is applied at the lowest level of storage manager, so um, pages, so, we do not know anything about whether we are on master or replica or wherever. Um, so, and there is some fragmentation because of, uh, because of another level of allocation, because of garbage collection and so on. But these cons are only about comparing CFS to, to some better approach, which, which isn't exist actually. So here is our roadmap. Uh, we have some things to improve till the next releases of Postgres Pro. Uh, we probably will, will try to submit it to Postgres, but I'm not sure whether it will be this 10th uh, version or the next one. And there are a lot of things to, to try to improve in, inside of Postgres Scale Core, just like improve data layout for some specific use cases for read-only data, for fixed length data, some tricks for indexes and all that. So that is all. Thank you for attention. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I'm still working on it. I ha I've tried an, a number of <laughs> a number of prototypes. Uh, there was a patch submitted to to Postgres about duplicates elimination. It's still still there, but I just. Uh, so duplicate elimination are not compressions per se. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've tried also to implement uh, prefix compression for between, I'm working on that right now, uh, but it's, it's a kind of not that cool because of alignment again. You know, you, you have index of two integers, you can keep 
prefix uh, separately and all those postfixes. Uh, after that, and it will still be the same size, there is no, no gain of compression. Yeah, but, but for text, for UIDs, for some other things, it really shows good results. I am just trying to, uh, to clean up the code to, to make some tests and we'll send it. Yeah, that, that, that's easy to, to try uh, to try this, but but we support a lot of a lot of pr platforms which which uh, requires strict alignment, mm -hmm. and the, it it won't work there. So probably we can try that. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah. It it won't work on on many platforms. That's that's, true. Th that's, that's an issue for for many Postgres improvements actually. <laughs> We probably can provide, yeah. We probably can provide another access method like Betree and you know unaligned Betree and something like that for for those platforms. But it's it's a future. Yeah. Oh yeah, that that's possible. Yeah, that, that would be a good idea. So it's worth thinking about, is it worth it if you also do online access? Which is like, it obviously would be hard to do online access, but if it was an open difference with that, like that could swing it, I don't know. I know that like a lot of systems um, have online access, you know, but there's a lot of other data systems um, mm -hmm. Definitely, that's it. So, any other questions? Yeah? Uh, yeah, wall compression is, it, it exists <laughs> since 9.5. Uh, there's just, uh, when you write uh, your page to, to wall log, uh, there is elimination of empty space uh, in the page and uh, then PGLZ compression, which is internal compression, will be applied. So there was a talk about it. I cannot remember actually uh, its name, but it, it, it was. You can read it in release notes, I suppose. And uh, it shows quite, quite good results. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear. Um, yeah, probably it, it would be.
tone. And again, that's about that wall is derivative from your data. If you if you have smaller data items like you know can compressed its compressed rows, it will be much better. Probably that's why toast toast performs that well. Yeah. You said that Uh, probably because not that many, mm, not that many systems support compression, uh, and for some reasons people cannot use them. Probably they have not only Postgres on this, uh, on this system, and they probably don't want to to get into details of you know compression file systems, and. Yeah, so, any questions? More? Yeah, there was, a, there was a discussion of pluggable storage. That's exactly what I, what I'm talking about when I told that we need more data specific storages. Uh, but it, uh, it occurred to be a really long way. So <laughs> I found out that uh, there is a lot of, you know, legacy in this area. Everything is, uh, Everything inside Postgres relies into this model, and it, it's really difficult to change anything in this area. I'm, I'm trying. I'm working on some prototypes, but they're not even close to be to be ready. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>